Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started with class. Hopefully you had a chance to try the do now. Should jog your memory from last class. Just in case, I'll help out. We're going to go over this problem. How many moles are in 5.2 liters of propane gas at STP? This is a molar volume question. Five point two liters is a volume. And we're asked about how many moles. This type of problem is for gases only. I like to highlight the information that I'm given so we have a volume there and the question is asking about how many moles. To set this up, we have volume to moles which is one of the problem types that we talked about last time. It was the last one that we left off with. One mole of gas has a volume of 22.4 liters. Doesn't matter what gas it is, propane gas, nitrogen gas, air. At STP, which is the standard temperature and pressure, one mole of gas has a volume of 22.4 liters. From that unit equation, we can write unit factors. I'll label our unit equation and the unit factors. We have to set up the equation now, starting with 5.2 liters. Which one of our unit factors do I need to convert from liters to moles? We need A. The liters cancel. We're left with moles. We need to have two sig figs here. And there's our answer. Any questions here? Okay. So this is where we are picking up from last class. We ended with molar volume. We're going to talk a little bit more about gases, but before we get there, I want to remind you of your extra credit opportunity. In Mastering Chemistry, there's the Chemistry Primer. It's available until about midway through finals week. I want to say that's like May 7th, but don't quote me on that. You'll see the availability within Mastering Chemistry. It covers all the topics that we have already covered in class and will cover in the next month or so. You can work on it at your own pace. 
you can use it in between the end of classes and finals as a way to study. It's up to you. But if you're looking at your grade, you saw your midterm grade, and you're like, hmm, this is one way that you can recover some of those lost points. The other way would be to, if you are not already, make sure you do the exam review. Go over it. Make sure you understand it. Come to office hours and ask questions. And you can use office hours or send me a course message when you're doing Mastering Chemistry. If you start it early enough, then you can get your questions answered and you can get more points on your homework by asking for help earlier on. Any questions there? Okay. Give me one second here. Because my mouse has decided to be trapped by my virtual machine. We'll fix it later. Let's keep pushing on. Density. We talked about density in chapter two. We focused on solids and liquids. Now we're gonna talk about gas density. The density of a gas is much, much less than a liquid or a solid. And we have a special formula for gas density when that gas is at STP. Remember that that means standard temperature and pressure. When a gas is at STP, you can calculate the density by taking the molar mass in grams of that gas and dividing it by the molar volume in liters. Now I reminded you of the molar volume concept because we need to remember one mole of gas has a volume of 22.4 liters. This is the number that we use in the density calculation. But we only use that if we are making a calculation at STP. If you're ready, I'll show you how we use this. So let me know if you're ready for me to move on. I'm gonna take that as a yes, you're ready. And we're gonna look at the density of propane gas at STP. It may seem like we don't have enough information here. We're trying to find the density and all we know is that it's propane gas at STP. we can use our special density equation and take the molar mass divided by the molar volume. All we have to do is figure out the molar mass of propane gas. Remember that you look at the periodic table and you use the atomic masses of all the elements that you see in the compound and you add it all up. We've got three carbons and when you look up carbon 
it's 12.01. So that's the C3 portion. Then we've got eight hydrogens. Depending on where you look for your periodic table, you'll either see 1.01 or 1.008. Either one you use, you'll get about the same answer. Go ahead and give that a shot and let me know what you get. So it should be somewhere in the ballpark of 44. Yeah, it should be somewhere in that range. We'll call it approximately 44 grams per mole. To calculate the density, You take that molar mass and divide it by your molar volume. Let me know what you get. Yeah, 1.96, 1.97, it should be somewhere in that ballpark. And the units are grams per liter. Don't forget units. Any questions here? If not, let me know that you're ready to move on. Okay. We're going to take that piece about the density of a gas in our special equation and link that up with our chapter two knowledge of density to do this problem type, to calculate the molar mass of a gas. We've got an unknown gas with a mass of 2.36 grams and it occupies, oh yeah, sure, I can go back for a second. Sure, no problem. And don't forget that I post this on Blackboard, too. You're welcome. So we're starting with a mass of 2.36 grams of some unknown gas. And it occupies 1.50 liters at STP. We've got to calculate the molar mass of the gas. What we know is that a gas at STP 
has a density equal to the molar mass over the molar volume. But we don't know the molar mass, so that doesn't help us. From chapter 2, we learn that density is equal to mass divided by volume. And that's true whether it's a gas, a liquid, or a solid. We have a mass and we have a volume. So we can use our generic density equation first. And that's what we're going to do. Calculate density using the mass divided by the volume for the unknown gas. We've got our mass, 2.36 grams, our volume, 1.50 liters. What's our density? Yeah. So at this point, you can carry a few more digits if you want to. We're not doing sig figs yet because we're not at the final answer. This is the density of the unknown gas. The second step is to calculate the molar mass. Using our special density equation. We take the density that we already calculated and set that equal to the molar mass divided by the molar volume. We already know what the molar volume is. It's 22.4 liters. Multiply by 22.4 on both sides. What do you get for your molar mass? Yep, so with three sig figs, it should be 35.2. So how are we feeling about that one? Let me know if you're ready to try one on your own or if we need to go over this one again. Yes.
22.4 is the molar volume. Molar volume, we said any gas at STP, one mole of it has a volume of 22.4 liters. So that's the definition. Okay, so it seemed like that was the only question. I'm going to let you guys try one on your own. Okay, so you've had a couple of minutes to give this one a try. I'm going to start going over it. If you would like, you can put your answer in the chat. We still have an unknown gas. It's got a mass of 1.33 grams, and it occupies a volume of 6.75 liters at STP. We have to calculate the molar mass. We're going to go through the same exact steps. We calculate the density of the unknown gas. And for that we use our regular old density equals mass divided by volume. The mass from the problem is 1.33 grams. The volume 6.75 liters. When you do that division, I'm going to put a lot of digits here. We're not doing sig figs yet. but we get a pretty small density. Then we use that density to solve for the molar mass. Our density is equal to the molar mass over molar volume, and this is at STP for gases only. Remember that the 22.4 liters is just the definition of molar volume. It's what one mole of gas occupies. And if you have the number of grams in the molar mass, that's one mole. So one mole of gas has a volume of 22.4 liters. Multiply both sides by 22.4. You're left with grams as your unit. And that's your molar mass. How do we feel about this one? You'll definitely see it on the exam. You'll see something like this on the um, exam review as well for the next exam. So now we've got three 
different ways to talk about the mole. We've got particles using Avogadro's number. And remember that particles can mean ions, can mean atoms, or molecules. We talked about molar mass, so the number of grams from the atomic mass, that's one mole. We talked about those two last week. We started talking about molar volume last week, did a little refresher here, and that's only for gases. What we're going to do next is a couple of problems that deal with gases doing kind of the two-step equations. The first one is going to be taking the volume of a gas and converting it to the number of molecules. I'm going to be working on it. You can either work ahead of me and see if you got it. It's very similar to what we were doing last week. Or you can just watch along. I'm going to do this example of volume to molecules, and then we'll do volume to mass. So both times, work along with me, or go ahead. Totally up to you. How many molecules of xenon gas occupy 0 0.430 liters at STP? We're asked about molecules. The number we're given is 0 0.430, and we know we've got something at STP. The fact that we have a volume and the problem says STP, your mind should be thinking gas, even if you don't see the word gas in the problem. We have a volume. and we need to figure out how many particles we have. We can't just jump from volume to particles. We have to use moles as the go-between. So what we're really doing here is setting up two little mini equations that we're gonna smush together to make one equation to solve this. The first mini equation that we're going to do, it's a little mini problem of converting the volume of gas to moles of gas. We use molar volume for that, and we just went over that as our do now. That's going to be our unit equation. Here are the unit factors. These unit factors don't change. The identity of the gas changes, but the numbers, one mole over 22.4 liters, they don't change for molar volume. The second part of this problem, we have to get from moles to molecules. Avogadro's number comes into play here. One mole is always equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. In this case, we've got xenon. The unit factors for this will also always look the same. The identity of the molecule or the particle or whatever it is will change, 
but the numbers themselves, the 1 mole and the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, always the same. Now that we have all of our unit factors written out, we can start putting together our equation. We were given liters of xenon. Our plan is to go from liters to moles and moles to molecules. For the first unit factor, we're looking at the green, volume to moles. Am I going to use A or B for my unit factor? When you see me writing the unit factors, you already know I'm going to ask. So just get that answer ready. We're going to use A. And what about converting from moles to molecules? That's the blue. Ashley is on point today. She said, look, I'm going to get this today. No one is going to stop me. Those are our two unit factors. When you're putting this into your calculator, you're going to take that 0.43, divide by 22.4, and multiply by Avogadro's number. You might want to use parentheses around that scientific notation just to make sure that it all stays together as a unit. Your answer, your calculator will tell you something like this. But we need to only have three significant figures. So that's one example going from volume to number of particles. How do we feel about that one? Talk to me. Good. Then we're going to move on to the next problem type. That's volume to mass. I'm going to help you get it set up a little bit, but then I want you to try it for yourself. What is the mass of 3.36 liters of nitrogen gas at STP? We have a volume. The question is, what is the mass? We know the formula, the chemical formula, for the gas, nitrogen gas, and we're at STP. So 
starting with the volume. For the first leg of the equation, we have to go from volume to moles, just like we did before. Use molar volume. But now, we have moles and we need to get to mass. You need to use the molar mass of nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas has two nitrogen atoms. So you take the atomic mass that you see for nitrogen and multiply by two. I want you to try to fill in the blanks here. I'll give you about five minutes, it might be a little bit less, I'll start writing some things in. But I want you to give it a shot for yourself. I'm going to start writing in some things here. For molar volume, we already started that. Last, you know, we did that with the last problem. So I'm just going to write out the, the unit factors for that. That's a different green. That bothers me. I got to change that. There we go. Baby Hefner has made an appearance. I don't believe that he graced us with his presence last week. He decided he was too tired, but this week he's all about it. So those are the unit factors to go from volume to moles. We use molar volume. For molar mass, it's pretty similar. So these are our unit factors. We're going from liters to moles and moles to grams. <laughs> to go from liters to moles. We use that one. To go from moles to mass, or grams, we're going to have the grams in the top. So this is the setup that you should have. In an exam setting, if you show me this setup, 
you'll get most of the points. If you get the wrong numerical answer, but you still have the right units, you get most of the points. We go through moles. We end up with grams. And it should be 4.20 grams. Let me know if there are any questions here. I'll take that as a no. So the last thing to do to close out this kind of section of chapter eight is to make our cheat sheet. You can use this when you're doing your homework and it will be really helpful for you to practice figuring out which unit factors to use. We're going to do these in pairs. The first pair, we're looking at moles to particles and particles to moles. Whenever we do something that has to do with particles, we use Avogadro's number. The unit factor that we use for the first one, 1A, one we'll call it, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles over 1 mole. If you're going from particles to moles, you want to flip that over one mole on the top, Avogadro's number on the bottom. The second pair that we're going to do is moles to mass and mass to moles. You'll have to calculate a molar mass here. If you're going from moles to mass, You'll need the grams of your substance on top and one mole on the bottom. To go from mass to moles, you flip it. Last but not least, We've got our group three, 3A, 3B. That's moles to volume and volume to moles. Gas is only here. We use molar volume for moles to volume you put 24 lead 22.4 liters in the top moles in the bottom volume to gas or excuse me volume to moles you're going to have the one mole in the top 
22.4 liters in the bottom. This cheat sheet will help you a lot if you have trouble figuring out which unit factor to use. Any questions here? Let me know if you need me to pause here for a second. But remember that this is available on Blackboard as well. So you can always check it out on there. Let me know if you're ready to move on. Okay. All right, then we'll move on. Percent composition. This is the kind of the beginning of the second part of chapter eight. Percent composition is just the mass percent of each element. So if we had methanol and I wanted to figure out the percent composition, I would have to first figure out the molar mass. So you go to your periodic table, and you say, okay, I've got one carbon, it's 12.01 grams, I've got four hydrogens, and they each are 1.008 grams, and I've got one oxygen. 15.999 grams. You total all that up and you should get 32.042 grams. Then we calculate the mass percent. We've got to find what percentage of that molar mass comes from carbon. Well, we've got one carbon, 12.01 grams, divided by the molar mass of the entire compound. And we multiply that by 100%. So the part is the carbon, the whole is the molar mass of the whole compound. You multiply by 100%. There you have it. I want you all to try to fill in the percent hydrogen and the percent oxygen. And based on how we do there, we'll either move forward and skip over the example, or I have another example for you to try. So keep that in mind as you're doing this. Figure out if you want to do another example or if you just want to keep it moving. I'll give you about a minute and a half. I'm going to start writing here. Feel free to keep working though.
And you can feel free to share your answers if you'd like. So there are all of the mass percents. I'm also going to color code these so that you can trace where we got this information. So how do we feel about these? Do you want to do another example for yourself or do you want to move on to the next topic? Okay. Here's another example. Calculate the percent composition of aspirin I'll give you about a two minute head start before I start writing things out. I'm going to start writing some things up here. Feel free to keep working if you still, if you're still working. So I'm not going to write out how I got the molar mass. But you just sum up all the carbons, all the hydrogens, all the oxygens. So that's the molar mass for aspirin. Then we have to take each part and divide by the molar mass. So you should get somewhere in the ballpark of 60% carbon, 4.5% hydrogen, and 36% oxygen. The total should be about 100%. So if it's 100.5, 100.3, that's fine. As long as it's not like 110%, you're good to go. Questions here? Let me know if we're ready to move on. Okay. Good, good. Here we go. Next concept we're building right now. Empirical formula. The empirical formula of a compound is the simplest whole number ratio 
of ions or atoms. The key here being simplest whole number ratio. Whole number. The molecular formula for benzene is C6H6. So if I were doing, looking at the ratio of carbon to hydrogen, it would be six carbons to six hydrogens. The empirical formula, we reduce that down as far as we can. And that's one to one. Another example, octane, there are eight carbons and 18 hydrogens. We want to reduce that down as far as we can. We can divide both of those by two and we get four carbons for every nine hydrogens. What we're going to do is calculate the empirical formula. And the reason why I harp on the simplest whole number ratio is because that's what we need to have as our answer. The empirical formula of a compound has to have whole numbers and it's gotta be the simplest whole number ratio that it can have. So you don't wanna have two of one element and six of another because that can be reduced further down to one and three. I'll show you what I mean by doing a problem. Let's say that we have a sample of chromium. We heated it with excess sulfur and we made some kind of chromium sulfide. We have to figure out what the empirical formula is. Relevant information, the mass of the chromium, heated with excess sulfur, so that tells us what it was reacted with, and what we made. We've got to find the empirical formula. Let's put together a rough chemical equation. We're starting with some chromium. We're reacting it with some sulfur. We're heating it and making some kind of a chromium sulfide. But I don't know what the ratio of chromium to sulfur is. So for my subscripts, I'm gonna put an X and a Y because I don't know what they are. It could be one to one. It could be one to two, who knows? I'll fill in my other information that I have. I know that I have a sample of 1.162 grams of chromium I don't know how many grams of sulfur reacted, but I do know the mass of my product. We can figure out how much sulfur reacted using the law of confirmation, conservation of mass. What that means is the mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products. So the sum of the chromium plus the sulfur should equal the mass of my product. We can figure that out, what the sulfur is, 
by subtracting the mass of the chromium from the mass of our product. When you do that, you get 0.716 grams. So for these problems where you're just given the number of grams of sample and it was heated with excess blah and we made this much product, you need to figure out how much of your other reactant you have. After that, you want to calculate the moles that you have for each reactant. The way you do that is like we've been doing. You take the number of grams. We'll start with chromium. You look up chromium on the periodic table. That's its molar mass. And that's our unit factor, one mole over the grams of substance. And that's how many moles you have of chromium. We do the same thing for the sulfur. Now that we've figured out how many moles of each, we can calculate the mole ratio between the chromium and the sulfur. In this case, it's the same number of moles. That won't always be the case for every question. When it's not, when there are different numbers, you want to put the smallest number of moles in the denominator. And when we get to an example like that, I'll remind you. So if you did that division, you would get one. But what does that one mean? It means that if you have one mole of chromium, then you also have one mole of sulfur. These numbers are the subscripts in our empirical formula. Now we don't write the ones as subscripts, we just write the element, right? So that is the empirical formula for this compound. How do we feel about that example? Let me know if you're ready to try one or if you need me to walk through another one.
I have more to do. So, here's what we'll do. I'll walk you through another type of problem that is also an empirical formula problem. Feel free to work ahead of me and try it out yourself. We're going to be kind of staying in this same area of problem solving for a bit because we're building on difficulty level now. You're always free to work ahead of me, solve things, and then ask questions later. So this problem type, we have acetylene is 92.2% carbon, 7.83% hydrogen, and we have to figure out the empirical formula. We don't see grams anywhere. That's okay. When you have the percent composition, or the mass composition, they're both the same thing, assume that you have 100 grams of your substance. So in this case, let's just say that we have 100 grams of acetylene. Now, those percentages can become grams because the percentages add up to 100. And we can use the number of grams to convert to moles and still figure out our mole ratio. That's what we're going to do. So if you're working along with me, those are the numbers that I'm using. So we calculated the moles. That's always the first step. The second step we have to find that mole ratio. Since we divide by small, the number of moles of carbon is smaller. So when we set up our ratio, we're going to have the moles of carbon on the bottom. Now when you put this into your calculator, you're going to get a little bit more than one. We call that one. If it's 1.1, even 1.2, that's one. 1 1.5, that's definitely different. But that one means that you have one mole of hydrogen for every one mole of carbon. So our empirical formula is going to be CH. For those of you who wanted to do another example, does this walking through another example like this help? Usually the area where students have issues is the mole ratio and translating that into 
the empirical formula. So let me know how we're doing there. Good. Then let's try a problem. You've got the percent composition of bismuth oxide and you have to find the empirical formula. I'll give you about a three minute head start and then I'll start writing things out. Remember, you need to assume that you have 100 grams of your substance. That way you can convert 89.7 grams of bismuth and 10.3 grams of oxygen into moles. And then work from there. Three minutes, then I'll get started. I'll go ahead and get started here. If you haven't gotten to an answer yet, keep working. There's time. First thing we do is convert everything to moles. So there's our moles of each element. For our mole ratio, we want to divide by the smallest number of moles. That's the number of moles of bismuth. we put the moles of oxygen in the top. When you put that into your calculator, you should get about 1.5. What that means is you have 1.5 moles of oxygen for every one mole of bismuth. There's something wrong with that. 1.5 is not a whole number. So we're not done here. We need to find the lowest common denominator between these two. More often than not, if you multiply by two, you'll get a whole number. So our whole numbers are 3 moles of oxygen and 2 moles of bismuth. And that is our empirical formula. Let me know if you have questions or if you're ready to move on.
I usually start with two because generally speaking, that'll get you where you need to go. But maybe it's maybe you have to multiply by three. But you're not going to have to multiply by like eight. Should be a small number. You're welcome. That was a good question. We're going to keep building on our empirical formula, mass percent composition type questions. Now, we've got four different elements. I'm going to give you five minutes to get started. Remember that when you have the percent composition, all you have to do is change that percent to grams and you're good to go to convert and then you'll have moles of each of your elements. Here there are four different elements. You're going to divide by the smallest one each time. So you should have three mole ratios. Again, five minutes and then I'll check in. I'm going to start writing some things out here. As always, keep on working if you're working on it. I've got a lot to write here. So I usually start a little bit earlier than the, you know, five minutes or three minutes that I give you, just so that we don't lose too much time in class. So hopefully converting the grams to moles isn't a problem. If it is, let me know. We've identified the smallest number of grams, or moles, sorry. So what we have to do next is write out all of our mole ratios. We have to have carbon to oxygen, hydrogen to oxygen, and nitrogen to oxygen. Now, the number of moles of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen are all pretty much the same. So we should get the same ratio but I want to write it all out just in case you didn't because that is also a possibility.
The smallest is the number of moles of oxygen that goes in the bottom. Since we're doing carbon to oxygen, we put the moles of carbon in the top. When you do that math, you should get 2.5. That's not a whole number. We'd have 2.5 moles of carbon for one mole of oxygen. And since that's not a whole number, we can't leave it that way. We're going to try multiplying by 2. Now we have a lowest common denominator, 5 and 2. So we can use this when we're writing our empirical formula. I'm going to write out all the others. They're going to be the same. And again, you don't have to go through all of this trouble if they're all the same number of moles. But for completion's sake, and so that you can see it all written out, I wanted to write it all out for you. So we need to put all this information together to put together our empirical formula. We've got 5 moles of carbon, 5 moles of hydrogen, 5 moles of nitrogen, and two moles of oxygen. So we got all of those from our numbers in the ratios. How do we feel about that one? This is about as complicated as it gets as far as figuring out the empirical formula. But there's still more to do. So if we're feeling good, we're in a really good place. If you're not feeling good, that's okay. There's still practice. So we talked about the empirical formula. Now we've got to talk about the molecular formula. And that's a multiple of the empirical formula. So if we, we figured out the empirical formula for acetylene, it's CH. Acetylene has a molar mass of 26 grams per mole. 
and we're asked to find the molecular formula. Not difficult at all. First thing you want to do is calculate the molar mass of your empirical formula. We've got one carbon, and one hydrogen. There's our empirical formula, the molar mass. Next thing we're going to do is divide the molar mass of the molecular formula by the molar mass of the empirical formula. molecular formula, we're told that that has a molar mass of 26 grams per mole. Our empirical formula, 13.018. 13, really. So when you divide, you get 2. It's going to be a little bit less than 2, but it's so close that we call it 2. What that means is that you take your empirical formula and you multiply it by two. So that instead of one carbon and one hydrogen, you have two of each. That's our molecular formula. I have one of these for you to try, and then we're going to string everything together. So the molecular formula of lysine, that's what we're trying to find. You're given the empirical formula, which is here. And you're given the approximate molar mass. Do the same thing that we just did. Calculate the molar mass of the empirical formula and then divide the molar mass of the molecular formula by the molar mass of the empirical formula. I'll give you about a minute and a half and then I'll start writing. I'll get started here. We're going to find the molar mass of that empirical formula. Lysine, by the way, is an amino acid. It's one of the building blocks of the proteins in your body very important chemical.
So the molar mass is approximately 73 grams per mole. Then we take the molar mass of the molecular formula, which is 146 grams per mole, divide by the molar mass of the empirical, which is about 73 grams per mole. You get 2. What that 2 means is that you're taking the empirical formula and multiplying it by 2. 3 times 2 is 6. 7 times 2 is 14. 1 times 2 is 2. 1 times 2 is 2. There's our molecular formula. How do we do? Excellent. And if you're being quiet in the background because you're not doing good, that's okay. I'm here for you too. So you can always send me a message or something like that. Request a one-on-one -on -one because office hours already happened. But I'm here for everybody. For the sake of time, we're going to keep going. Now we're going to put it all together. You can have percent composition or the number of grams and go from there to the empirical formula and from the empirical formula to the molecular formula. If you want to just go for the gold and try it out yourself, you can. For those of you who might be a little bit more timid, you want a little bit more guidance, I got you. Stick with me. I'm going to first write out the steps that we need to do to get from our percent composition or that kind of information to the molecular formula. First step is always getting to moles. In this problem we're told that a compound contains 8.81 grams of carbon and 91.2 grams of chlorine. We don't have to do anything there to figure out how many grams. We've got grams. Just convert to moles. The second step, we've got to figure out that empirical formula. You're going to calculate that mole ratio Third step, you need to calculate the molar mass of your empirical formula. Then you can determine the molecular formula. I'll highlight the relevant information. That's what we know about this compound. We know how much of each element and the molar mass. Molecular formula question mark. That's what we've got to find out. First step, this is what we've been doing for all of chapter 8 converting grams to moles.
We've got our moles. Step one complete. Now we have to figure out what our empirical formula is. And to do that, we need the mole ratio. We're going to divide by the smallest number of moles. That's the moles of carbon. You put the moles of chlorine on top. With that division, you get 3.5. What that means is you have 3.5 moles of chlorine for every one mole of carbon. But we can't leave it at that because that's not a whole number. Empirical formulas have to have a whole number, the simplest whole number ratio. We can multiply by two And now we have whole numbers, and we can't reduce this anymore. That's our empirical formula, C2Cl7. That was our second step. Now we're finding the molar mass of this empirical formula. We've got two carbons. And we've got seven chlorines. There's the molar mass for our empirical formula. Final step, we take the molar mass of the molecular formula and that was provided in the problem. We divide that by the molar mass of the empirical formula that we calculated. That gives us five. So we're taking that empirical formula and multiplying it by five. Two times five is ten. Seven times five is thirty five. That's our molecular formula. I'm going to color code the the steps that we have so that it's a little bit easier for you to find. So that's one example 
of going all the way through finding the empirical formula first and then using that to figure out the molecular formula. Are we ready to try one or do you have questions? Let me know how we're doing. Then here's what I want you to do. Last problem for the class. Figure out the molecular formula for lactic acid you're given the molar mass and the percent composition. I'll give you about five minutes. I'll start writing at about three minutes or so. If you have questions, you can always let me know. I'm gonna get started with writing out the solution. If you're still working, which is kind of a lot to write, I'd be surprised if you were done, but stranger things have happened. Go ahead and keep writing, keep working on the problem, and I'll explain things as I go. We're going to use the same steps as we did before. We've got to take all the grams and convert to moles. Now we have to figure out the mole ratios so we can put together the empirical formula. Remember that you divide by small. Well, we kind of have a tie for the smallest number of moles. So we'll just use moles of carbon. first ratio we're going to do is hydrogen to carbon. And when you have multiple elements, like more than two, I recommend writing out which ratio you're doing and then making sure that you keep your units straight. It's really easy to kind of flip things and, you know, switch them around. So the number of moles of hydrogen will go in the top. That gives us two. 
which means for every two moles of hydrogen, we have one mole of carbon. Now the number of moles of carbon and oxygen are the same, but if they weren't, you'd have to do this step. Here we get one. So we've got one mole of oxygen for every one mole of carbon. That makes our empirical formula CH2O. we have to calculate the molar mass of the empirical formula. We've got one carbon two hydrogens and we've got one oxygen. That gives us roughly 30 grams per mole. It's not exactly 30, but it's 30 point something. Finally, we take the molar mass of the molecular formula, which is 90 grams, per mole. And we divide by our empirical formula, the molar mass. That gives us three. We take our empirical formula, multiply by three. One times three gives us three. Two times three gives us six. One times three gives us three. There's our molecular formula. I'll highlight with the same colors as I did on the previous slide so you can match up the different steps with what we did. Did we still do good on that one? This is as complicated as it gets. So if these problems were smooth sailing for you, you should be just fine for your homework and for the exam. Speaking of which, reminders. Chapter eight, your master in chemistry assignments are due this Sunday by 11.59 p.m. If you have not submitted your chapter check-in for chapter eight, you still can. You can submit it up until the same time as your master in chemistry is due. You'll just lose some points each day. Some points is better than no points. So get it in there if you haven't submitted it. We've also got exam four coming up. That's next week. That's our last regular exam for the semester. Once that's done, the next exam you have will be the final. It will cover chapters seven and eight. It's gonna be available Wednesday of next week. 
I'll post the exam review. We'll do exam review next week and start chapter nine. I know with Mastering Chemistry due, an exam coming up, and you kind of have other obligations, including other classes and most of you work, you're probably not going to have time to watch a chapter nine video. I will still make it and post it, but in class next week, I'll kind of approach it from the standpoint that you probably haven't seen it. I still encourage you to watch it. If you do have the time to watch it before class, by all means, go for it. And you should certainly watch it before the next week <laughs> because we're going to take two weeks to cover chapter nine. So if you don't get a chance to watch the video before class next week, it's okay. I got you. But make sure that you do watch it. We're going to go over this in more detail next week. But I just want to give you a sneak peek. For exam four, type your work. For the math problems. So all the chapter 8 related questions. Type out your work. So that means show me your unit factors. You can maybe put out all of the, you know, the equation that we have at the end where you're starting, let's say you're going from volume of a gas to mass. Start with that volume. Give me your unit factors. And that way, I can assess partial credit. If you don't type anything in that little box, then I can't give you credit. So show me what you're thinking. Just put something. I can't guarantee that putting just something will get you points. But you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So partial credit will be in full effect for this exam. Now, the Chapter 7 questions, it's a little bit more difficult to do that. Um, when you're balancing an equation, it's right or it's wrong. But for the math problems, I want to give you, I want to give you credit for what you know versus take all the points because you didn't know everything. We'll cover more about exam four. You can ask your questions. Like I said, I'll post the exam review today. Outside of that, I've got nothing else for you. So, you're free to go unless you have questions, in which case, stay and ask.